Hello, this is the next part of Open Dog version 2. We've already done quite a lot of work on this and there are seven videos in my YouTube channel already. In the last video, I had this up and walking pretty convincingly and mixing all those axes together. So don't forget to check that video out to see how I achieved it. In this video, we're gonna do some minor hardware upgrades and then make it a little bit cleverer. This entire project is open source and you can find all the CAD and code on GitHub. And if you'd like to support me through Patreon or YouTube channel membership, then those links are in the description to this video. First thing we're gonna have a look at is those knee motors again. So if you've been following the project, you'll know that the leg here is operated by a motor here and a pulley, and you can just see the top of the pulley here. But the knee motor's actually in the shoulder here and that operates the pulley down to the knee, and that means that the motor mass isn't thrown around when the leg moves. What I found though was that the motors heat up and then they melt the plastic they're mounted on, so all of this is still 3D printed PLA, and the bolts holding them on just pulled through and that caused the motor to skew and the belts to skip. So last time I installed these aluminium plates and you can just see the top of it here, that acts as a heat sink and also acts as a stronger mounting. However, everything's just fixed with the same bolts that go through the plastic, holding that motor on, the four mounting bolts. So what's happened is they've still got warm and they've still pulled through. And now you can see there's a slight gap here where that plate is pulled and the motor still skewed. So we need to fix that. Every other motor, however, including the one that actually operates the leg there is double braced. So it's bolted on at the back and it also has a bearing in the end and a six mil piece of steel that supports the other end of the pulley. And that stops the motor having force on and stops it twisting and putting a load on those bolts. However, all the other pulleys are slightly longer. They have a longer extension on the top and that means it's wider and I can fit that six millimeter internal diameter bearing in. The ones for the knees are much shorter and we don't have that much clearance. So for these, I put a five millimeter internal diameter bearing in, but that still leaves a very thin wall. So hopefully they'll be strong enough now these face a piece of 2020 extrusion which holds the whole leg on and that's got a hole in which we can tap to five millimeters. So that's ideal for the five millimeter hole. We can't really make it easily any bigger or smaller. I've taken the outside of the leg off and now we've fitted that five millimeter piece of studding that's tapped into the aluminium. There's a washer on there. I'll just put a bit of thread lock on to stop it coming out. There is my new pulley on the motor there and I've also used thread lock to hold these screws in holding it on so they don't work their way out. The outside of the legs fitted back and if we remove the encoder we can see the actual motor bolts I mentioned. I just heated up this plastic with a hot air gun to reshape the plastic where they'd pulled through a bit but with hindsight I should have made these less deep so there's actually more plastic for them to bite through or put another metal plate on the outside or something like that. I've done that to all four legs and just giving it a quick test to check it works okay. There is quite a lot more friction in those pulleys because they're much tighter so we might have to adjust the idlers. But for now it seems to work just as well as it did and hopefully those motors won't just bend at melting the plastic and cause the belts to skip. So it seems to work pretty reliably mixing all the axes there and moving in all directions and that works just the same as it did before. Obviously there's no force control on this. We're just moving to fixed positions on fixed timers and interpolating between the positions as we go and I detailed that in the last video which is part seven of the series. And the way this works in terms of stability is that we've got those motors with the ability to be back driven because we've only got a five to one reduction on all of these motors with just that simple belt drive. We've got quite a powerful motor trying to hold its position and dumping more current on it if it gets back driven and that causes almost a virtual spring and because the legs are moving quite quickly that sort of evens everything out like suspension and it stays pretty stable. And for now that's how it's gonna be. We could have force control where we can actually measure the force on each joint and try and even it out but for now it's just dead reckoning essentially. So there is quite a lot of load on those pulleys which are obviously holding that whole knee and the same on all the others. So we'll see how long those pulleys last with a hole in the middle for the bearing. Ideally I'd have some made of metal or something like that. But there's a number of other things I want to redesign including a higher belt reduction, bigger motors and lots of other stuff. So at some point there'll be an Open Dog 2.5 and I'll make all those improvements. And for now we'll just stick with the plastic and that's what I'd really like to do to keep it 3D printable. So for now I'm just driving it by radio control with my everything remote that I've used on lots of projects. That's just six axes and some switches there for motor enable and bits and pieces for the menu. Eventually we're gonna make a ROS controlled robot and we'll make a ROS remote and that's gonna be coming up in the coming weeks. But for now I wanna get a Jetson Nano on here so we've actually got a computer of an operating system and we can try and do some more intelligent control.
workflow, we've got some new parts in the form of this top rack. This is made of aluminium rails and 3D printed sections. And that is going to hold a Jetson Nano and anything else we want to put on there, which is on its own little carrier. We've also got another battery holder that slings below and that's going to hold a battery, which is actually an 11.1 volt LiPo, but with one of these five volt regulators so that we can power all the five volt systems and that's 10 amps. So there isn't a battery on there at the moment with a little regulator, but we're just going to replace that with one big battery that'll power the Jetson Nano and everything else. And thanks to 3D Fuel for providing the filament. Don't forget to check out my channel for more 3D printing projects and check out the 3D Fuel website at 3dfuel.com. So those frames sit on the existing carbon fiber rails and I was going to make the top section carbon fiber as well. So it's like a double decker, but I couldn't get any carbon fiber in time, hence it's aluminium. The new battery sat below here and that just pulls up and it's attached with Velcro to the bottom carbon fiber rails. That's the existing 24 volt battery that powers all the motors. So we've just got one now for the motors and we've got one there that's gonna power all the five volt systems. Ideally, I'd redesign the whole body so it's more accommodating for things like this. So I'd have worked in a place to put them in the first place. These body sections are really the wrong shape and a bit too heavy. So it could do with a redesign, but for now we're just gonna keep bolting things on and hope for the best. There's my Jetson Nano and I've got a Raspberry Pi camera version 2 on here and that's on a little adjuster so that I can make it look up and down and have a look at me hopefully. I've got the Raspberry Pi cable there that goes straight onto the Jetson Nano and that's my 5 volt from the regulator in its bottom. Eventually I want to put more sensors on this including a LiDAR that can mount on these rails further back and potentially an actual sensor head with a servo mechanism that can turn around something like a Kinect or an Intel RealSense camera or another depth camera so that we can actually use that. And eventually I'll convert this to a ROS robot. At the moment I've got my really useful robot which is a wheeled robot that can do mapping and navigation and I'm still learning about ROS and the navigation stack. I think it's going to be a bit harder with this robot because we really need that wheel odometry data to come back accurately to show what the position and pose of the robot is based on how far it's traveled. That's going to be a lot harder with these springy legs. So I really need to think about what other sensors we need, at least a magnetometer or an inertial measurement unit that can tell me how far I've rotated accurately. And going forward and backwards and sideways is going to be really tricky, so I'm still thinking about that. So for now, we're just going to train a machine learning model on the Jetson Nano using this camera, and we're going to make that do, hopefully, gesture recognition so that we can actually move the robot around without the remote just by doing hand signals. But before we have a look at that, it's time for a quick ad from the video's sponsor, and that is Private Internet Access. Private Internet Access is a VPN provider, but what exactly does that mean? A VPN connects you through an encrypted tunnel to another place on the internet, which means it looks like that's where your internet traffic originates instead of where you actually are. This means your location is masked and your IP address is replaced with another one from the network. So this is useful, for instance, for unlocking geo-restricted content on Netflix, Amazon Prime, and also YouTube. So you can watch videos that are only released in other regions. So Disney Plus did this recently where they launched first in the US and we couldn't watch it in the UK unless you had a VPN. Private internet access have a strict no logs policy and their services are built on open source technology. So you can always have a look under the hood to see how it works. Private internet access is available for all platforms, including Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and many others. You can use one subscription to protect up to 10 devices, and there's a 30 day money back guarantee in place. If you use my special link, which I'll put in the description to this video, then you can get special pricing for less than $3 a month, and you can get three extra months for free. Private internet access has over 10,000 servers in 70 countries with 24 seven support. There are lots of payment options, including Bitcoin, and it's got really good reviews. I actually tried it out for streaming both Netflix and YouTube, and it's really usable. You'll find some other VPN providers are a bit slow for higher data usage. So don't forget to use my special link in the description to this video, and you'll get special pricing for less than $3 a month and three extra months for free. Right, let's see if we can get this dog trained. So here's my dog training setup. Obviously we've got the dog right here and on the table I've got a monitor which is plugged into the HDMI of the Jetson Nano and a keyboard and mouse so I can see what I'm doing. So far we're just running the DetectNet example that ships with Jetson Inference which is basically the stock examples for deep learning models that do vision recognition. So you can see it recognizes a person pretty well. It also recognizes 99 other household objects and I've demoed this in various projects before. I've also trained the machine learning model to recognize symbols and I've also trained it to recognize my facial expression for the Wolverine project so check that out. But what we need to do for this is some sort of hand gesture so we really want sort of 
go backwards, one for sort of coming forwards, and then left and right probably, and possibly another one that I haven't decided what to do with yet. So we're using transfer learning to retrain an existing model on a retraining SSD mobile net, and we can do that with the camera capture utility provided by NVIDIA by just highlighting aspects of the image and then going and categorizing them into categories that we say. So I did about 160 images of all of the different hand poses. We probably could do with more and we could probably do with them on different backgrounds of me wearing different t-shirts. And if we wanted it to work with members of the general public, of course we'd need different skin tones and ultimately different people to do it in different settings. But for me, it's going to work okay. We can then retrain the model and using transfer learning that only took about 20 minutes. And here we go, so now the model seems to work pretty well, that's up, that's towards me, so that's the robot going forward, the robot going away, that's right, and that's left. So pretty happy of how that works. Now we can actually go and see how big this is as well, so you can see in the console to the left, we should be able to see the coordinates, or at least the width for my hand, so we could stop people pranking me in the background at events and things like that and only have it when I'm a certain distance. So I probably should train with um, actually more images because we still get a few weird things that happen. But on the whole, that seems to be pretty reliable. So what we should really be doing is putting ROS on the Jetson Nano and then communicating with the Team C that currently controls all the hardware with the ROS serial library. So it's really similar to the really useful robot that came up a couple of weeks ago and I explained the whole process in that video. And then write a wrapper for the machine vision, deep learning stuff, that sends command velocity messages to actually drive the robot. I'm not quite ready for ROS on this robot though, so I'm not going to do that just yet. We're just going to do the temporary version, which is a little bit hacky. And that looks like five wires and one ground wire coming from the Jetson Nano GPIO pins into five spare digital pins and ground on the Teensy. So we can just bring them high and low when various things are detected and we can just drive the robot by reading the digital pins and deciding what to do. I've put some filtering on the data. So first of all, I've used the confidence rating that's supplied as part of that Jetson inference model. And that tells you how confident it is that it's recognizing the thing you've trained it for properly. I set that to over 90% and that means you have to be really kind of close to the camera and you have to be really definite about your signals of your hand. Otherwise the confidence rating is lower and doesn't work. Similarly, if you do it in the background and the item is really small, then the confidence is much lower because I trained it with my hands really close and really clear with the camera. The other thing I've done is put a timer on the Arduino code that's running on the Teensy so that that pin has to be high or low for over 300 milliseconds. And that means it cuts out some of the data where for instance I'm doing going from right to left and I might get something that looks like the coming towards me signal in the middle of those for a split second so we filter all of that out. That means that basically I've got some data I can drive the robot with, but at the moment I'm using the sticks to drive it on the remote and I'm moving those quite slowly to sort of accelerate and decelerate as I get to where I want to drive to. So what I've also done is put a filter on the data so that it rises and decelerates and when it falls again, it then decelerates. So it's a bit like moving the stick rather than just a massive step change that will make the robot walk at full speed and stop suddenly. So on the right hand side of the screen we've got the Arduino monitor looking at that Teensy code and it's looking at the variables after the filtering. On the other side of the screen we've got the raw data whenever it detects something. So you can see that one going crazy, but the Arduino code shouldn't do anything as long as I do the gesture for less than 300 milliseconds. So that means that filter's working okay. If we go and make clear definite hand gestures to the camera, so that's the robot going back, we should see a step change in the first column, the second column ramping up to 500, and then waiting for a bit and ramping down. And that means the robot will walk backwards for a specific amount of time, keep walking, and then slowly decelerate and stop. If I bring it towards me with the coming towards me gesture, that value should go negative and do the same thing so that it will walk in the other direction. And we do need to scale these values. I've obviously got the other ones as well. So for left and right, and that's the next column which ramps up and ramps down again. So it will accelerate and decelerate gracefully basically and going the other way too. So that seems to be working okay. For the up gesture we've got a slightly different thing, that's the last column which is basically a step change of 500 and then it sinks to zero again. So that seems to be working pretty well. I've used one of the spare switches on the remote so we can now turn on gesture recognition and I've still got the dog on the stand so we can check that it all works properly. So this should be walking backwards and coming towards me 
and going this way and the other way and going up. So I'm looking forward to trying that on the floor. So the robot does decelerate as the numbers go down on that filter and you can see it walking on the spot a bit as those numbers get smaller and that allows it to get its feet back together at the end of doing walking. At the moment it walks if the number is non-zero and that filter as you saw in my little test took a while to decay. I've actually turned down the minimum time to one second so it'll always walk for at least a second but it'll actually carry on walking if my hand is still there. So if I hold my hand in front of the camera with a gesture then it'll keep walking in that direction. At the moment we're just doing backwards and forwards and left and right, I'm not doing any yaw moves but that seems to be working okay, at least the gesture recognition is pretty reliable. Now you'll see the robot is rotating slightly clockwise in the yaw axis and we'll chat about why it's doing that in a moment. So that's walking, let's try the up motion. Well, the gesture recognition works okay, but there's a couple of other issues. You can see in the video the robot is starting to yaw slightly clockwise when it's doing the other actions that it didn't do before, and I believe that's for two reasons. First of all, one of the pulleys I put on at the start of the video broke through, so that motor's kind of hanging and half rubbing on that pulley and that bit of studding that I threaded into the end of the 2020. The other issue is the motor on the other side, they're both the front knees in fact, the one on the other side, the motor's getting too hot to touch for some reason, and I'm not sure why that is, after a very short amount of time. So I'm not sure that's the extra load because of that much tighter belt now, or whether something else has gone wrong with that motor. It still looks like it's in the right place and everything's working, and um, it seems to move freely enough, so I'm not sure what's happening there. It may just be the straw that's broken the camel's back, putting this extra rig on the top with the Jetson Nano, the extra battery, and the regulator and all the other plastic mounts for the battery there. We've got about a kilogram and a half that's gone on that's made that robot a bit heavier, and it was kind of only just on the edge of working anyway. The, the motors did get warm before, but now that one does get extremely hot, and I'm not sure why. So I guess the upgrade that I mentioned several times before, of having bigger motors and a better belt ratio, it's probably time to think about that at some point before we load up and try and get it to carry any more mass. The other issue of course is the lighting that I'm using for filming in here tends to kind of white out the camera so I have to be careful which angle I point it at. With the camera on top here it's quite low to the ground so generally robots with a camera pointing up are bad because they point at lights in the ceiling and that's why the really useful robot with its tall stick is probably the next thing that I'm going to try something like this with. The other issue is you can't really see where your hand is within the camera view so it'd be really good to have a screen on that. And that's something I'm also going to bring to the really useful robot. So that robot is going to have a kind of linear section that goes up and down its stick. And that's going to have both a screen and the camera on it. And possibly the Jets and Xavier that we've got in that robot. So that's going to be much better for those sort of vision tasks. And you'll be able to see what it sees when you're doing gestures to it. So that's the end of this video. I'm going to publish the CAD and code, including this top frame, the new pulley and the code on both the Jetson Nano and the enhanced code that I've put on the Teensy there that reads those digital pins. It'll be published as a separate thing from the rest of the project on GitHub because it is kind of experimental and I pretty much don't advise you do it this way. All right, if you'd like to subscribe and like the video if you liked it, also don't forget you can support me through Patreon and YouTube channel membership if you'd like to. Most of my projects are open source like this one and you can find those links in the description to this video. All right, that's all for now.